Hi, my name is Matthew Shahada. I'm a second year on the BA acting program, and we're here in Spears Lock Studios, where I'll be performing an excerpt from Cider with Rosie by Lori Lee. The week before Christmas, when the snow seemed to lie thickest, was the moment for carol singing. And when I think back to those nights, it is the crunch of snow and the light of the lanterns on it. Carol singing in my village was a special tithe for the boys. The girls had little to do with it. Like haymaking, blackberrying, stone clearing, and wishing people a happy Easter, it was one of our seasonal perks. By instinct, we knew just when to begin it. A day too soon, and we should have been unwelcome. A day too late, and we should have received lean looks from people whose bounty was already exhausted. When the true moment came, exactly balanced, we recognized it and were ready. So as soon as the wood had been stacked in the oven to dry for the morning fire, we put on our scarves and went out through the streets calling loudly between our hands till the various boys who knew the signal ran out to meet us. One by one they came stumbling through the snow, swinging their lanterns around their head, shouting and coughing horribly. Coming carol barking men! We were the church choir, so no answer was necessary. For a year we had praised the Lord, out of key, and as a reward for this service, on top of the outing, we now had the right to visit all the big houses, to sing our carols and collect our tribute. Eight of us set out that night. There was Sixpence the Tanner, who had never sung in his life. He just worked his mouth in church. The brothers, Horace and Boney, who were always fighting with everybody and always getting the worst of it. Clergy Green, the preaching maniac. Walt, the bully. And my two brothers. As we went down the lane, other boys from other villages were already on the hills bawling Kingvinsluch and shouting through keyholes, knock on the knocker, ring on the bell, give us a penny for singing so well. They weren't an approved charity as we were, the choir, but competition was in the air. Our first call as usual was the house of the squire and we trooped nervously down his drive. A maid bore the tidings of our arrival away into the echoing distances of the house. The door was left ajar, and we were bidden to begin. We brought no music. The carols were in our heads. Let's give them wild shepherds, said Jack. We began in confusion, plunging into a wreckage of keys, of different words and tempos, but we gathered our strength. He who sang loudest took the rest of us with him, and the song took on shape, if not sweetness. Suddenly, on the stairs, we saw the old squire himself, standing and listening with his head on one side. He didn't move until we'd finished. Then slowly, he tottered towards us, dropped two coins in our box with a trembling hand, scratched his name in the book we carried, gave us each a long look with his moist, blind eyes, then turned away in silence. As though released from a spell, we took a few sedate steps, then broke into a run for the gate. We didn't stop till we were out of the grounds. Impatient, at least, to discover the extent of his bounty, we squatted by the cowsheds, held our lanterns over the book, and saw that he'd written two shillings. This was quite a good start. No one of any worth in the district would dare to give us less than the squire.